Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Circle Up and Get Real, where by now you know we talk about things that matter with people who matter. And the secret is that's everybody who wants to talk to me. But today, my guest is Dick Richards, who has been a friend of mine. Man, Dick, we I was trying to figure out when we first met each other, and I think it was in around 2005. I do not recall either. I know. It's been a long time. I don't even recall the circumstances. I'll tell you what I remember. So before we met in person, I heard about you because I started a blog in 2004 before anybody ever knew what blogging was. And my blog was called You Already Know This Stuff. Right. I recall that. Yeah. And I met a lot of people through that writing. And you were one of the people whose work came to me somehow. Yeah. Well, your title grabbed me. Uh-huh. I already know this stuff. So I thought, immediately thought, so why should I be reading this? I think you said that. You were the one who said so. And I tried and loved it. <laughs> so and great. I think it was probably Phil Gerbyshek. Who yeah, it was Phil. That. Yeah, you're right. Put me onto that. You're right. So Dick is an author. That's how I first came to know you, Dick, through your work, in your genius work, which we'll talk a little bit more about. And recently in my circles in Fargo, where I am still doing coaching, consulting, facilitating, that word genius has come up a lot in the last, I would say, six months. And every time somebody mentions genius in their genius or, yeah, yeah. you know, some sort of way, I think of you. Because it's what you're talking about people who have been through a workshop or Mm -hmm. no randomly, randomly. Uh, By the way, okay, so Dick was here in Fargo three different times, and we had an event called the Bigger Small Talk Summit, right? Where Dick spent a day helping people discover their genius through the way he does it. And yes, people still talk about that, they still have their name tags that say, you know, the the gerund and the noun. Um, So I just wanted to reconnect, Dick, because our paths have crossed again recently because of our shared love of art. And um, there's just a lot of synchronicities that I don't think are coincidental. (laughs) No. So welcome to Circle Up and Get Real. I'm happy to be here. So what are are you up to these days, Dick? Well, (laughs) that's... uh recovery so you can tell what happened yeah what happened was that last december late i broke my hip uh falling over a step and it was in a place that i didn't expect it to be yes (laughs) (laughs) oh darn and that has led to you know 10 months of uh physical therapy plus complications like i also uh tore up muscles in my leg when i fell Mm. So it's been it's been a long haul. Uh, one consequence of that is that in the last year, I've done exactly one painting. Oh, really? In the last year? Yeah, and I didn't like it. Oh, wow. So I'm on the process in the process of trying to reconnect with that muse. Nice, nice. You need to because it's beautiful work you do. Um, you. I'll I'll put some links out so I can show people what what you're up to. But yeah. the the way I first connected with you was about your work. Um, which at the time I feel was a little bit, uh, well, maybe a lot ahead of its time because you were talking about intangibles um, like Mm -hmm. heart and, and genius and, you know, what makes us unique and a lot of things when people weren't talking about that. Yeah. Yeah. When I finally got it, that the genius is the energy of the soul Mm -hmm. is when it really, um, the whole thing took off for me. So that came to you as some sort of awareness in your work? Well, I was introduced to the concept in a very mechanistic way. Uh, I was working in England with a a man, and we were doing, a man who was an internal consultant, and we were partnering up to do management management and leadership training for the company he worked for. Mm -hmm. And he was fond of a process he called your, of a concept he called your core process. And he describes core process as what you do with the information that you get to transmute it into behavior and attitudes. Mm. And his notion was that everybody has a unique core process. We use that to great effect um, in the training, but I 
always felt like there was something missing, mm -hmm. you know, because we talked about it as a kind of mechanistic process. You're a box, input mm -hmm. comes in, you do something, output goes out. The way you do is your core process. Okay. And it made sense to the clients we had because most of them were engineers. Yeah, I was going to say either computer engineers or that uh, makes sense. Petrochemical. Right. Okay. <laughs> so the box is the chemical plant, you know. Right. But it always felt like there was something missing. Mm -hmm. And I went looking for what was missing and landed on um, the concept of genius in the Greek, in the Greco Roman context. Mm -hmm. And the notion there was that. When the soul enters the earth school, it meets in turn the three goddesses of fate. And it receives a mission, a challenge. Mm -hmm. And the final goddess, what Jess is, grants it a genius, mm -hmm. which is the energy it requires required to meet that purpose. Yeah. So it's the energy of the soul. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens is the soul then passes across the plane of forgetting and forgets that. Yeah, right. So for some reason, I could never been able to figure out, we are challenged to find it during the life, to find that purpose, to find that genius. Maybe it's because we have to work at it to deserve it mm. because it was just handed to us, mm. okay? handed yeah. to the soul. So, if, so all of a sudden, that our concept of core process took on a spiritual dimension. You know, when you, I, I'm, I remember so well when you say that. I remember, well, I, I did get to witness it three different times, actually four, because I actually took the course uh -huh. with an organization in Minneapolis. That's where I first met you. I can't remember the organization. Uh, that would have been, um, oh gosh. It'll come to us, <laughs> <Well>. <laughs> but I got to be a participant in that course for oh, that right. client. Yeah. And that's where I first met you. And I took the course and I did the work myself. And I, I don't know if I told you this, but during the, the day of the course, we had to try on different names for our genius. And I came up with one that I thought was great for me. And I tried it out as we did on partners. And we, you know, we, you, you had us talk to other people in the room. And I came up with the idea that mine was inviting dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I remember the partner I was talking to when I thought this was it, this is the one he said, okay, maybe, but what if it's not inviting? What if it's something else? Because if you, what if happens if you invite somebody and they don't come or they don't accept the invitation? And I went, oh, I'm wrong. That's right. You're right. But then I thought about it more. And I said, just because you don't agree, doesn't mean it's not right for me. Right. And that's where I knew that was what my genius was. Right. And here you are doing it right now. I am completely doing it, Dick. <laughs> yeah. So, and and I remember you teaching us that it wasn't something that you, um, it, it, it's something you uncover. And so the process of uncovering it doesn't mean you're actually creating it in the moment, even though I'm a wordsmith and that tends to be get me stuck. I loved how you facilitated this process for people because you would walk around the room and they would tell it to you and you would ask a question and they'd be like, but I thought this was it. And you'd say, well, try it again. Because you knew from your experience that when you land on this, there's something magical that happens. It happens. A friend of mine described it as when he understood it, what his genius was, it was like looking in a mirror and see himself for the first time oh wow wow and so i'm always when somebody says i think my genius is blah 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 i'm watching their face mm -hmm. you're not judging what they say you're reading their soul right well yes reading, yeah. reading the truth of the uh of the statement yeah 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 so say it out, say it out loud to the group you know uh, was was so i want to just i'm jumping in here that workshop comes from the book called is your genius at work right and you want to and this isn't the first book right no that was, well that was my first book artful work artful work was my first book and then i have another one called setting one. your genius free yeah well that was a precursor to, to is your genius at work okay yeah i'm a fan can you tell dick i'm a fan of your work there's another one uh, yeah, what well, there's another book it's um 
gosh, the title is, it's a book about leadership. And uh, it's titled, um, oh, Did what? that one come before or after? In the middle. Um, in the middle, okay. In the middle, where is it? Why did I forget the title of my own book? Oh, but but you're, you know. Oh, there's oh yeah, 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 The Art of Winning Commitment. The Art of Winning Commitment. Oh, okay. wow. Okay. It's a leadership book. Yeah. So when, is your genius at work was the last one then? Yeah. Okay. And this is the one that I know best. Right. So do you want to talk about this, um, how this came to be and how it was named, the, what it was named? Um, well, yeah, I actually think it was a mistake. Really? The publisher, it was, it was published at a time when career development was first and foremost in people's minds. And they wanted to pitch it as a career development book. Mm -hmm. Felt wrong to me, but I went along with it. Don't do that very often. Mm -hmm. I see it as a personal growth book. Mm. You know, it, it's not necessarily, although it's very powerful for understanding what kind of work and what kind of work situations will be good for you. Mm -hmm. That's also true in relationships marriages you know what kind of church you go to yeah yeah you know, all, all, everything very um, true and i get what you're saying about the subtitle being the marketing of it right, right. four key questions to ask before right. your next career right. move right but right. yeah you're right there's way more to this sure yeah and um so yeah i went along with it um and have had regrets about that because people have people have told me, you know, this isn't just a career development book. Yeah. You want to you the, the idea is to surround yourself with people and enter into situations where your genius is valued. Mm. And mm. if you're not doing that, you're not going to be happy. Right. You know? Right. So can you give us a kind of a brief overview of how we discover this or uncover this? Well, yeah. I mean, the, the book is chock full of exercises. That's what it is. Yep. Uh, one is to simply notice what people ask you for. Mm. I mean, if people know you well, they will ask you for your genius. They will know what it is, even uh. if they can't articulate it. Mm -hmm. They'll spot mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. uh, and to look for what you're attracted to. Right. And to look for words and phrases that you repeat often, oh. because they may be clues to the, the, the name. It's a thought experiment. I ask people to uh, enter into a thought experiment with, with assumptions that you do have a genius, first of all. So I'm not going to argue with that. You know, yeah. I don't want to I don't want to, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> enter into the thought experiment, yeah. give it a chance, and come, and you'll need a gerund you know, an ING word mm -hmm. and a noun, at yeah. least. And you want two or three words that succinctly describe your genius. And when you have it, you'll know it. How did you come up with that formula, a gerund and a noun? Experimentation. Really? Just, yeah, just experimenting. Um, I, it may have been that that was the original way it was introduced to me when we were talking about core processes. I, I don't recall. Mm -hmm. But it but it works, so I stuck with it. Yeah. Uh, even though I was putting another layer on it, you know, a spiritual layer onto it. Right, right. I remember so distinctly you talking about the dis different um, religious traditions. Yes. I remember Ka and Ba somehow. Ka and ba. It, yeah, well, in my research, I discovered that the concept that we each have a gift. And it's unique. And... Uh, exists in just about every spiritual and cultural tradition. It's biblical. Mm -hmm. It appears in Judaism. Mm -hmm. In Taoism, mm -hmm. they talk about teh, T-E-H, mm -hmm. which is your unique contribution to the Tao. Wow. The most beautiful um, <laughs> thing I uncovered was a story about an African tribe. It, when a child is born into the tribe, a ceremony is held in which the child's contribution to the tribe is revealed. Mm. And the tribe then commits to nurturing that contribution. Wow. 
And I remember seeing that and thinking, why are we doing that in education? You know? Yeah. Why are we doing that in first grade? Yeah. Why aren't parents doing something like that? You know? Yeah. Um, how, how would everything be different if we were doing How would that? everything be different? Mm -hmm. If we if we committed to nurturing the gift of genius <clears throat> excuse me, in each person. Right. So in your work as a organizational development, I mean, you were in for 30 years, you did a lot of work in leadership. Yeah. How did you come to that place in your career? I was invited in. Huh. Uh, I was part of a consulting firm <clears throat> that was um, had contracts with the three or four counties surrounding Philadelphia to provide what at the time was called humanistic education, mm. to provide that kind of training to school districts in that area. And also to provide training to not-for-profit organizations, mm -hmm. drug clinics, uh, alcohol rehab clinics, you know, places. Mm -hmm. And we were training staff in those in those areas. That organization went out of business. Okay. And one of my friends who was I was working with went to work for a large multinational corporation as the training director and brought me in to work to do work there. So that's how my consulting career started. That's how I made the leap into consulting from working for an organization. Yeah. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> wow, excuse me. That's good for okay. your talk line. Oh yeah. well, no, we'll we'll edit that out. But yeah, on the yeah. on the video, it's all raw. We just upload the raw video because yeah. that's what I it do. Means I, I do. I do have some throat issues. No, you're good. So anyway, I was invited in to work for to do work, and that <coughs> and over the years that exploded. Yeah. Yeah to like 15 different countries. Wow. Yeah. So independently, one led to another. Is that how it kind of happened for you? Yep. Uh, I was working with this person. She went to work for a corporation, hired me for cer certain consulting gigs. That organization started moving me to different places. We need you to do this in Belgium. Wow. And then people left that company and went to other companies mm. and they brought me there. Yeah. So in the end, I think I worked in uh, for five, four or five of the Fortune 50. Wow. So somehow back, what, when was this? In this the would have been 80s? 80s and 90s. Okay. 80s and 90s. So in the 80s and 90s, people understood the importance of what you did which was kind of squishy wasn't it like very squishy <laughs> <laughs> how do you measure that very squishy uh, a lot of it was um working with leaders who were stuck hmm. right and um you know george is having a hard time over there in canada you know yeah we're gonna you know when, when wants to go up and spend some time with george mm-hmm and a lot of that, and then, you know, I so I had to develop a model for how to do that kind of work. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and then in the end, the last gig I worked on was a large-scale organizational change project, 60,000-person company that completely refocused its entire business. Wow. So I don't... <laughs> I have a theory about this. Something happened somewhere along the way when people understood the importance of the work you did in the 80s and 90s so much that they would say, George needs you in Canada or somebody right. else needs you to witness them or to see their greatness or to help them find their genius or what exactly were you doing? Well, a lot of different things. So I'll tell you about George um, as an example. George was the CEO of an affiliate a national affiliate of an American company. Okay. Right. 
and he had a reputation for being a really tough hombre. Mm -hmm. He was the guy that, George, we need you in Australia. It's all screwed up. Go fix it. Mm -hmm. You know, George, we need you in France. It's all screwed up. Go fix it. Mm -hmm. When I met him, when they, when I met him, uh, he was in Canada, and uh, he was near retirement, and he wanted nothing more than to come back to the United States at the corporate headquarters where his children and their and grandchildren were. Mm. But he'd been told that he wasn't welcome there. Oh, wow. Because his way of working and fixing all of that was crash and burn. Wow. So I interviewed George's um, management team and the word that came up most was abusive. Mm. And in my conversation with George, I said, George, you know, what, what's, what does this mean? And he said, well, you know, it's the way I raised my kids. It was tough love. Mm. And I said, so how are you with your grandkids? Well, you see the smile on your face. Yeah. He says, oh, it's totally different. Yeah. You know, I try and teach them and I learn with them and I play with them. And I said, well, why don't you try being that with your friends, with your people around you now? Mm -hmm. And two weeks later, I, I, I went back there and his assistant, who sat at a desk outside his office, came over to me and said, is George mad at me? I said, I don't, I don't have any evidence that he's mad at you. Why? And she said, well, he's being really nice to me. <laughs> wow. And a year later, he got the promotion. Wow. So, you know, that I had to, and, and that's reflective of a model I used for that kind of work, which is that, you know, we have four kinds of energy, physical energy, spiritual energy, intellectual, mental energy, and emotional energy. And when somebody is stuck, it's usually because they're stuck in one of those forms, mm. the exclusion of the others. And my job was to shift the energy. Wow. So when I say to him, how are you with your grandkids? I'm switching from that mental construct. I've got to be a tough, loved father right. to a more emotional construct. I can be a loving grandfather. Wow. So mm -hmm. almost, so then I, I, I got a, a lot of a business just helping people shift their energy. Wow. Did did George recognize before you were able to reflect to him where he was stuck? Or did he just think that's the way it's supposed to be? He thought that's the way it's supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is what they've rewarded me for. Mm -hmm. And notice there, you know, we didn't have to train him in any new behavior. Yeah. We didn't have to send George off to a big training program. He already knew mm -hmm. how to do what he needed to do mm. he just wow. couldn't make the shift on his own yeah so when you worked with george you said it was a year later that he got the promotion how right. how often were you with him and what did you do with him specifically i only saw him twice more after that really i didn't need to wow 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 this is this is really interesting to me because it seems that the America, I'll just speak for America. I don't know anything about Canada, but I'm getting guessing it was similar. You know, we have processes and and systems and uh, measurements and metrics and all these things that we have to be, you know, looking for in every moment to make sure that we change the thing we say we're going to change. And and I think that takes a lot. I, I think it takes too much time measuring things that don't need to be measured that. And it's all mental energy. Yeah. Mm. It's entirely mental energy. <clears throat> and uh, another another example is uh, a little technique I had a lot of fun with. You're working with a team that's in trouble to, and they're working on a problem and they can't get it. And you can see that they're all in mental energy. Mm. So what I used to do is say, all right, let's quit this. We're going to go out and take a 20 minute walk. Shift the energy. Yeah. Physical energy. And yeah. usually... By the time we got back from the walk, they had the problem solved. Wow. Wow. Just by shifting the energy from all that mental energy to physical energy. Did they did they 
when they hired you for these things, it was all on word of mouth because they saw the results that you were able to help them. It's not really, don't take this personally, but it's not really you. It's through you that you're able to do the work when you get the spiritual dimension, which is where you landed with the genius. Right. That's right. I mean, if you don't get, and when I say spiritual, I certainly don't mean religious. Yeah, right. Right. You know, all I'm meaning by that is commitment to something that's larger than yourself. Mm. And some people say, well, that's not spiritual. That's that's something else. You know, but for me, it works to call it spiritual energy. Yeah. Then the commitment to something larger than yourself could be a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. It's not really about the label then, because that would be in mental energy again. Right. It's it's something it's it's something that's lifting your spirit, engaging yeah. your spirit, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. One um, plant manager in England told me that you know sometimes I would ask them why why are you doing this work anyway? Mm. You know why this? Yeah. You know, and he said, well, you know, he was a chemist, and he said, well, it's not about the science, it's not about the chemistry. I do this because this plants provides jobs for a whole lot of people in this region Mm -hmm. that's what i'm about Mm -hmm. and for me that's a spiritual that's a spiritual you know it's it's larger than yourself yeah right so when you look at the world now you've not been doing this work for a while i mean you've been retired for a while from this kind of work when you look at the world and observe it what are you seeing A lot of stuckness. Yeah. A lot of people who are just stuck in whatever position they ha- happen to be occupying at the moment. A lot of um, um, purposeful ignorance. Hmm. Tell um, me more about purposeful ignorance. Well, people reading only what they want to read and what they agree, only what they agree to. Mm-hmm. And they're not reading anything that that, that doesn't agree with them. Mm. Or watching a different cable channel. Right, right. You know, and that's what I see a whole lot of people who are just a lot of stuckness and division that's, you know, I don't want to get into the political. (laughs) Mm -hmm, Yeah. Yeah, because it's a it's a it's a black hole. And for me, it's all um it's it's superficial somehow. Mm -hmm. You know, the divisions are even religious is to me is kind of superficial. You know, it's not what we ought to be looking at to bind us. Mm-hmm. We are people seeking some kind of identity, seeking some kind of connectedness, mm-hmm. and hooking up with something that's destructive. Wow. Because because so, it's because you need to human beings need to be connected. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, sometimes I think that need for connection overrides common sense. Well, okay. So I love what you said when you said we need connection and we're connecting with things that are actually doing more harm to us. Correct. Maybe well, because we're we're looking to um, be right about the attitude we already have. Right. Huh. Right. Right. And uh, you know, getting people out of a mindset that they're devoted to is a really, really hard thing to do. Yeah. How do you do it? Do you think that the work you were doing in the 80s and 90s would be as accepted today in corporate America as it was then? you got to remember, I have to remember that I, I was fortunate in that I was able or I was able to find or was found by people who were of that mindset. And I'm guessing they're still there. Mm. You know, they're still around. Yeah. But they're certainly not the majority. So me getting passed around the way I was meant that, you know, George was passing me off to Philip because he knew Philip would be of that mindset. Right. Right. And that 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 brought that, you know, that took me to, as I said, you know, I don't know, 14, 15 different countries and half a dozen large companies. So you said that's- All word of mouth, I'm a terrible marketer. Yeah. 
I think when you're marketing yourself, it's really hard to see yeah. the results that are coming through you. Right. And, you know, you, you talked about, well, you didn't actually say it like this, but spiritual spirituality to me is more about love for things than fear of things. Right. And if people are in fear of things, you know, like George was in fear maybe of people seeing his soft side, mm -hmm. his grandkids didn't care. They didn't want to see his hard side. Right? right. Right. So if people are led by fear, it would make sense that they would have defenses up all the time. Right. Yeah. And today I, I think you're right. When you say that people are still there, I, I, I would hope they're still there. I would hope that, you know, the people who are now in charge of things are not all the loud voices we're seeing when we look at political conversations right now. Yeah. I think that one of the largest, one of the biggest problems I encountered in organizations was if there was a, a, a senior manager who was the kind of manager that you and I are talking about, mm -hmm. you know, other managers have had a tendency to undermine them. Uh. They didn't understand. They wouldn't understand, and and then and, and sometimes they would um, subvert that manager. You know, mm -hmm. what I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they didn't want that. <laughs> that's not how we are. That's not how we are around here. Right, right. Because it's is it too scary to look in the mirror? It's unfamiliar. I mean, it's just, I don't know if it's scary. It's just unfamiliar, you know, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. But as I say, you know, I still met a lot of uh, managers from 20 years ago um, who were open to uh, looking at themselves, open to um, thinking of themselves in different ways, open to relating to the people around them in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, and and understanding the the wisdom of uh, you don't need to be doing that tough love stuff. Oh yeah, you know. Yeah, so I'm very hopeful that the people you impacted and influenced in your thirty plus years um, are now doing. Let's say being the. Right. The genius being their genius so that whatever they're doing is coming from a different place than it would if they didn't know what they didn't know correct correct and, and i wouldn't i don't pin all of that on the work i did with genius because in my um consulting with executives and senior managers i rarely used that okay i mean it wasn't the right it wasn't the right frame mm. the right frame was that you know for for forms of human energy and getting yeah. stuck in one of them or relying on one uh, when it wasn't the right, it wasn't what was needed in the situation. Right, right. So when you got to the place in your own work, when you were doing the genius work, because setting your genius free, well, even artful work, uh, the subtitle is Awakening Joy, Meaning and Commitment in the right. Workplace. Right. So were you able to use this with those kind of George people? Um, that's more philosophy than it is um, a set of tools. The idea in that book is that um, all work can be viewed as a form of art. Mm. And, what, and maybe it would be useful to think of it in the way artists think about their work, which is the artistry is in the process. Mm. Right? Yeah, you know, and and it was a it was an attempt. That book was an attempt to have organizations um, value the artistry in whatever work that was being done, mm -hmm. um, and then the people to understand that if that if they're if they're if they didn't see the process of their work, the artistry in the process, they weren't going to be happy with it. Mm, right. Whatever that work was. Sure. I mean, you know that. It's a, yeah. you know, you've got beautiful paintings, but the joy really is in the process. It is. You're absolutely right. right. I don't think I would have known that had I not experienced it though. Right, right. 
exactly. You know, you and I've been talking a little bit about this as we're both on this art journey. Um, you, when did you start painting? Oh, when I was about six years old. So a long time. This isn't new. Yeah, for yeah, yeah. It was something I, you know, set aside mm. when I was um, 21, 22, mm. and then just picked up again when I was in my 70s. Yeah. So it didn't, it, it, it was just covered up. It didn't go away. Yeah, no, it didn't go anywhere. It was, it was, it was there. Yeah. And and then you, so it's just when you started posting that you picked it up again? Just when I started posting. Oh, posting the pictures? When you started showing your yeah, work? Yeah, 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 yeah. After I decided it's time for retirement. Yeah. You know, I found in the, in the bottom of that closet right over there a box in which I had stuffed my art supplies 40 years ago. Wow. And I took it out, and I got news here. A kneaded rubber eraser is good after 40 years in a box. <laughs> good to know. <laughs> so, you know, I started drawing. Mm. Um, you know, pencil, graphite. And that was, um, that, that it was too, um, I don't want to use the word tedious, but it was too tedious. Yeah, okay. <laughs> For me, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and I realized two things. One is I needed a different medium, and the other was <clears throat> I'm, I'm not cut out to do um, realistic painting. Mm. So I started experimenting with acrylics and had a real breakthrough. A real breakthrough. Let me, yeah, let me tell you about that. I'm working on this painting, it was about 18 by 24. And I'm applying acrylics to the canvas with a palette knife. Okay. And putting paint on and squirting it with water and putting more paint on and squirting with water. And I wasn't liking it at all. It, and was, this is horrible. This is awful. And I'm getting frustrated. And I took the knife. And in a peak of frustration, I slashed the painting. Just the top, not through the canvas. Okay. But slashed one, two, three, four, five, six strokes. Taking the top layer off to reveal a layer underneath. Mm. And I stood back and looked at that and said, that is really cool. Mm. And that's where I learned about um, trusting my impulses, trusting my intuition, trusting my, my training in color and design. And trusting my impulses mm. rather than thinking it through. Yeah. So if I go back to my model, you know, the process becomes more a process of, you know, emotion and intuition than a thought process. Mm -hmm. And and trusting, like you said, trusting Trust. that that man, there's so many metaphors, aren't there? Yeah. Well, you know, trusting, you know, if try something, if it doesn't work, what is it? It's some paint and a canvas. Right. Try, try again. Yeah. It's so. What, what, what have you lost? Right. Well, yeah. And you can paint over it if you don't like you it at all. You yeah, can just... yeah, yeah. I have some, I have some canvases that are too heavy to carry. <laughs> so many layers of paint on them. Right. Oh, uh, your work is beautiful. I, I was really inspired by your work when you first started posting it on social media and when i decided to start this not even a year ago i felt the same way it was more about abstract than realism but people said why don't you try something realistic and so i'm trying it but yeah. it's not in the same spirit well re remember the uh, message of that book heartful work the yeah. joy is in the process yeah it's so true. It's and so the true. The process of you know, line drawings with a pencil. And I've, I've produced some really, um, they're hanging around the house. Mm -hmm. Some really nice scenes from Italian villages that I, mm -hmm. photographs that I took. Mm -hmm. But I didn't enjoy the process. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know what? Have you heard of Rick Rubin? No. So Rick Rubin is a music producer um, who does a lot of music producing with the big bands um, that you've heard of. And he also wrote a book that came out in January called The Creative Act. Uh. And 
in his book, he talks all about what you just said about the process and the creation. Yeah. And he says, if you create art to be sold, it's a commercial, you commercialize it. There's nothing wrong with that. But he said, it's not art then. Right. Right. My inspiration was a uh, man, Stephen Nakamanovich. Okay. His book is called Free Play. Free Play. Okay. And he's a, he's a um, musician. Yeah. And he talks about improv a lot. And improvisational musicians have been a great inspiration for me in my in my painting. Wow. Stephen Nakamanovich, Free Play. Okay, I'm writing it down. I can't write the last name, but I'll find it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll find it. Okay. That's awesome. Well, and, and it's funny that Rick Rubin is not a musician himself he uh, produces people's music so he was on uh 60 minutes in april ish that's where i first heard of him and anderson cooper was interviewing him and they were walking through his music studio in california where you know like adele and johnny cash and all these black eyed peas came to his studio to produce music and he lays on a couch in his office in his in his studio with bare feet and her cargo shorts and then he'll sit up and say that. And Anderson Cooper said, so Rick, do you play an instrument? And he said, no, not really. And he said, well, do you work the soundboard? Are you the engineer? And Rick said, no. <laughs> and Anderson Cooper said, so what do they pay you for? <laughs> and he said, the confidence I have in knowing what I like. Mm -hmm. And that to me was really one of my breakthroughs in right. not just my painting, but my work, the work right. I'm doing as a coach and speaker and author and podcaster i was so, lacking so the process of podcasting is joyful for you it is joyful yeah. because i get to connect with you i get to connect right. with people i get to have yeah. conversation you know the subtitle is conversations that matter with people right. who matter right. right what we're doing is improvisational because it's never been you right. know we haven't had this conversation before it's no. emergent right and that's what i love about it and that's the, that's the spirit I try to bring to my painting. Mm -hmm. And the truth, you know, if I look back on it, it's also the spirit I tried to bring to a lot of the consulting and, and coaching I did. Mm -hmm. I never walked in. I didn't walk into George's office saying, all right, here's what I'm going to do today. Yeah. It emerged. I mean, it mm -hmm. came out of me saying, people think you're abusive. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go from there. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Well, and, and in my experience, bringing you back to Fargo, I think it was three times you and Mel came to Fargo, Um, which, by the way, you pr probably hadn't been to Fargo. Had you been to Fargo before that? No. No. You had been to Minneapolis, so you had been, been to Minneapolis. Yeah. It was Jesse Fries. That's it. That's it. That's exactly it. Yeah. Yes. I forget the name of the company, but. It was yes, Jesse. it was Jesse. Yeah. And um, so in Fargo, you were here for a couple of days, three different times, and yeah. we we just kind of um, improved one day where we used open space and right. allowed conversations to emerge. And then you guided us for one whole day, helping us discover our genius, us being the people who were there. I will tell you that they were small groups, you know, maybe 20, 25, 30 people, but they still talk about you, Dick. They still talk about that experience for them and how, how valuable it was to have someone speak the, the name of their genius to someone else and have the other person say yes and tears come to their eyes because they knew they they hit it right. and that's that's very very powerful work that you've been doing yes thank you i um uh, it's powerful for me too it's mm -hmm. still wonderful i mean every once in a while um i get a note somebody tracks me down online i get an email or something somebody saying thank you for this book you know yeah. yeah yeah well and i know two people who have purchased your art from those yes i know one two deanna ah uh, yes and, and and i think kelly kelly yes i think i think two people or at least they've talked about your art to me and said yeah. how much they love I, it i'm only aware of one okay so yeah. we talk about you here dick behind your back we talk about you you can talk about me in front of me <laughs> <laughs> So it's um, it's a pleasure to have you here to talk about this concept that while 
it doesn't um always come to the top of people's conversations it when it emerges like you said you can see it you can see it in people's eyes you can right. see what happens when george recognizes that he they, he can treat he, adults the way he treats his grandkids right and that it will be better for them and him and him yeah yeah right. and easier by the way right yeah so that's a good point we we as leaders we as anybody who's willing to go first in anything will receive the benefits of the work we're doing when we're building the bridges right. that haven't been walked on yet right. so right. Are, are, can you tell about your art in a way that like I could put a link so people could see it? Are you going to get back into it again? Well, um, yes, I am. And it's all online. It's okay. at, uh, dickrichardsart.com. Easy. Okay, super. I'll put a link to that. And it's for sale? It's for sale. And it's also available in a variety, variety of different forms. Oh, good. Christmas tree ornaments. Awesome. Okay, this is um, good timing. What else? What else? Tote bags. Okay. And prints. Great. Great. So you need to take a piece of Dick Richards with you. I, I'm going to go shopping. Okay. Here. DickRichardsArt.com. Dick, DickRichardsArt.com. Awesome. And the latest are, are the 25, a series of 25 paintings painted in a state of Mushin. Mushin is a concept that's popular in martial arts. Uh, but also in other art forms as well. It's a Japanese term. Mm -hmm. And it means mind without mind. Ooh. So you're trying to get into a state where the mind is not inactive, but isn't in control. Yeah. You know, it's a, and I do that sometimes by um, meditating before I start and seeing the painting as an extension of the meditation. Mm. And trying to finish the painting within four or five minutes. Oh wow, really? Yeah. Wow. There's can you tell? One, could yeah. I tell looking at it? Could I tell the difference? Yeah, you can. Okay. You, you can, it's fun. It's it's spontaneity. Okay. It's a. It was um, inspired by a woman named Mam Mami Kawasaki, mm. Japanese woman who doesn't have a big online presence because I don't believe she speaks English. Mm. But she has a video of herself doing a painting, an abstract painting, just using ink, and doing this wonderful painting in two minutes. <clears throat> and, and I realized that if I give myself that two-minute time limit, I'm almost guaranteeing I'm not going to overthink it. Yeah, oh, for sure. I can stay, I can stay in that Mushin state, that state of you know, mind without mind, Right. No mind, oh, or, that's... Mind without, or mind without thought. But, you know, it's you, you've been there when you meditate. You've been in that state, mm -hmm. right? and so it's trying to maintain that state as you're painting. Mm. Mm. There's a series of twenty-five paintings there called Mushin Number One, Mushin Number Two. Okay, great, great. I will make sure that we have a link in the show notes about that. And I am inspired to try that. I've been way overthinking my painting. Right. These behind me, I didn't think at all. <clears throat> These were totally emergent right. before I knew what I was doing. Right. So, right. Right. Uh, I, the Mushin paintings are all done in watercolor. Mm. Are, are, so you don't use a lot of watercolor now, do you? Well, when... Um... I used to do a lot of oil paint, well, I'm sorry, uh, acrylic paintings. Yeah. But I did them uh, in a studio where I was working and there were other people around. Wow. Or out on my patio. I don't have room inside the house. House on the patio. Can't do that in the summertime. It's Arizona. Right. <laughs> and when COVID hit, I didn't want to go to that studio any longer. Mm -hmm. So I started to work at home. And decided to work with um, watercolor because I can do that in a confined space. Sure. When I was doing the kind of painting what I was doing with a crook, I was a very messy painter. Mm -hmm. I mean, I once threw paint, threw some paint at a canvas and hit my dog. So, <laughs> so yeah. 
Yeah, I didn't want to be doing that. Right. And I'm stuck with it now. It's been three years, two, three years. Okay. The, the blue shit paintings, all, all watercolor. Okay. When you start up again? Because you said you've only done one painting in the last year. I had one painting in the last year and I didn't like it. So I'll be starting again soon. All right. I'm in a place where, okay, I'm done with this Mushin thing. I'm cursed with a genetic predis predisposition to curiosity. <laughs> I think I am too. <laughs> so the question is, all right, I've done that. What's next? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll be excited to see what emerges. So, yeah, me too. Uh, any idea when the muse is going to strike so we can uh, say no I can't do that. <laughs> well, can't we'll, do be, that. we'll be watching for sure thanks, thanks, so thanks. dick richards art is the best place to get a hold of you dick richards art dot com yeah that's the best place okay so if anybody has heard anything that they'd like more about go there connect with dick you and i've been kind of connecting on message well, the best way to connect with me is it's email Okay. Thechristianart.com is is the website where all the paintings are. But if they wanted to actually if you connect, want to connect with me, at, you know, at dickrichards@cox.net. Okay. Perfect. Email. Or okay. Facebook. Facebook. Yep. Or on Facebook. Okay. Uh, that's where we've been connecting. Facebook Messenger. Yeah. Facebook. So, thank you, Dick. Thank you. What a Thank pleasure. You. What a treat. What a treat this is. Uh, it's so good to see you in, in well, in person, but you know, it's as close as many times we can get without traveling. But I'm, I'm a fan of Zoom because I really, really realizing that energy is non-geographic. Me too. And there's a different kind of intimacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's intimacy nonetheless. Yep. Right I right. agree. I agree. So thank you so much for being with me today and everybody who's listening. As always, thank you. Get real. We'll talk to you again. Thanks, everybody. So, um,